sleep. And I was like, Lord, I help. I don't not. I hope I do not put these people to sleep with this. Uh, but um, I really, honestly, um, everything I need to say has been said this morning and tonight in prayer. And uh, uh, I'm just going to put a little teaching to it. Uh, hopefully, not too long. Lots of verses, as usual, but all of them together and a little bit easy to follow, I do believe. Um, over the last couple of weeks in church, and, um, you know, just as a point of clarification, I, Bob was saying things this morning, we've been hearing things, and he's been talking about uh, the move of Pentecost in us and in our denomination, and also that we've had it, but what have we done with it? That was one of the things that he brought up several weeks ago. And even today, he was talking about, look, the Holy Spirit's here. He's calling you, but he's not going to be here all the time. And the fear is, um, you know, have we missed our call? And in the United States, it's a little scary because I went with my brother, who was a Methodist brother to this thing, and we were just talking about the church today in the United States. And we're looking at things. And he, sh share, he shared this little link with me. And I just want to read something to start. Okay? There we go. Okay. The fact is that the percentage of people identifying as Protestants has declined since the 1970s. While the total number of Protestants has increased, 62% of Americans identified as Protestant in 1972. Only 51% did so in 2010. Yet, because of the population increase in the U.S., there are still 28 million more Protestants in 2010 than in 1972. But as a percentage, it's declining. And you share with me some of these statistics. Um, even in the Southern Baptist Convention, the largest Protestant denomination in America declined by 105,708 just from 2011 to 2012. That's 100,000 people. While that sounds like a lot of people, the denomination could lose that many members every year for 150 years before the pews in the Southern Baptist churches would be completely empty. But we see the decline. We start seeing some of these numbers going down. As a matter of fact, some of the numbers, I'll just get to them here. Some of these denominations you may not know, you may, but Christian Church Disciples of Christ in 1965 had 1,918,000 people and in 2012, they had 625,252, a decline of 67%. The Reformed Church of America had 384,751 members in 67. And in 2014, they had 145,466, a decline of 62%. The United Church of Christ, we've heard of that one. The Congregationalists. In 1965, they had 2,070,000 people going there. In 2012, they were down to 998,906, a decline of 52%. The Episcopal Church, well known, went from 3.6 million to 1.8 million. And the Presbyterian Church, USA, went from 3.3 million to 1.7 million. And the United Methodist Church went from 11 million 26,000 to 7,391,000, a decline of 33%. And you see these numbers. And you say, Lord, what do we need to do to keep and grow the church in America? Amen. And that's really what I want to talk about. And we're praying about it just now, right? Uh, we, we already have the message. I'm just going to put some scriptures to it, to be honest with you. Um, you know, uh, will we see God shifting some of these gifts to other denominations as Bob had been talking to, which I hope he does, which would be glorious. Amen. But I hope... He doesn't take it from us because we've been messing around, right? Now, um, I don't want to see the U.S. church and Christianity changing into Europe, where basically some of these uh, cathedrals are now used as um, uh, nightclubs, <laughs> you know, uh, youth spots, but nothing, nothing religious at all. And if they are religious, it's a very secular religion, uh, I talked to some of the missionaries at General Council, and they said, look, if one person gets saved in Europe, one, we call each other and celebrate. That's how tough it is in Europe right now because they become secularized. Just it's all the world, and what does it matter? You know, and I'm going to ask that question, what does it matter to us? Um, you know, 
I think God has shown us a pattern in his word on how to grow the church. That's very simple, right? Um, we can make it complicated. We make it challenging. Here's the tough part, right? But look at Mark 5, 1 through 20. And I'm just going to read stories. Today's not going to be like a bunch of jump, jump around. It's not going to be theological stuff. We're just going to read some stories, and we're just going to take some stuff from it. And these are popular stories. A lot of you guys, if you've grown up in Sunday school, you've heard it, okay? Then they came to the other side of the sea, to the country of the Gadarenes. Now, that area has several names, Genesaret, Gadarenes, also the area of the Decapolis, Okay, verse 2. And when he came out of the boat, immediately there met him out of, the spirit, out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit who had his dwelling among the tombs, and no one could bind him, not even with chains. Because he had often been bound with chains and shackles and chains, and the chains had been pulled apart by him, and the shackles broken in pieces, neither could anyone tame him. We all know the story, right? The demoniac who lived in the tombs. Always, night and day, he was in the mountains and the tombs, crying out and cutting himself with stones. What a predicament this guy was in, right? How bad was this guy's situation? Living in graves, cutting himself with stones, crying out night and day. Uh, I'm certainly, uh, you know, this guy was a nuisance to his community. And uh, we keep going. When he saw Jesus from afar, he ran and worshipped him. And he cried out with a loud voice and said, what, do, what have I to do with you, Jesus, son of the most high God? I implore you by God that you do not torment me. For he said to him, come out of the man, unclean spirit. Then he asked him, what is your name? And he, he answered, saying, my name is Legion, for we are many. And he begged him earnestly that he would not send them out of the country. Now a large herd of swine was feeding there near the mountains. So all the demons begged him, saying, Send us to the swine so that we may enter them. And at once Jesus gave them permission, and the unclean spirit went out and entered the swine. There were about 2,000, and the herd ran violently down the steep place into the sea and drowned in the sea. So those who fed the swine fled, and they told it in the city and in the country, and they went out to see what had happened. So we're going to hold it right there on 14 for a second. They went out to see what had happened. Who is the they? Was it the shepherds, the pig shepherds? I don't know what you call pig shepherds. I don't know, you know, the pig tenders. So well, they went back and told something, right? But they told something that didn't happen to them. They told what they saw through their own eyes. And they told it to the surrounding country and the city. And they went out to see what had happened. It was the surrounding country and the surrounding city that went out to see what had happened. This was a big commotion going on. Then they came to Jesus and saw the one who had been demon-possessed and had the legion sitting and clothed and in his right mind, and they were afraid. Who's they? The city and the people, okay? Go ahead. And those who saw it told them how it happened. This is the pig tenders, right? They told him how it happened. And to him who had been demon-possessed and about the swine. And they began to plead with him to depart from the region. So who's the They the city, and the people. They said, get away from us. We don't want you around. All right? And when he got into the boat, he who had been demon-possessed begged him that he might be with him. Now, that seems like a reasonable request. Please take me with you. This God who delivered me, may I please go and just hang out with you. He would have been a disciple. Isn't that interesting? But Jesus had something in store for him to do. Go ahead. However, Jesus did not permit him, but said to him, Go home to your friends and tell them what great things the Lord has done for you and how he has had compassion on you. And he departed and began to proclaim it in the Decapolis, all that Jesus had done for him, and all marveled. So Jesus touches this man, delivers the man, sets him free, and says, Go tell your friends. Go tell him the good things that the Lord has done for you. Go on. Next one. I think we're at Mark 7. Okay. Now, what happened in the interim? Jesus goes back and ministers. He doesn't stay there. And what was the impact of that one man's testimony? Okay. What happened? 
And again, departing from the region of Tyre and Sidon, he came through the midst of the region to, of Decapolis to the Sea of Galilee. Same book, two chapters later, right? He had been in that area, healed the man. Now he left, now coming back. And they brought to him one who was deaf and had an impediment in his speech, and they begged him to put his hands on him. Who's the they? Of the city. Which city? Decapolis, which is in Genesaret. Now, who changed their mind? The demoniac, who had been delivered, right? So they, thank you, Lord, the same they, brought this guy to Jesus. And he took him aside from the multitude. So it wasn't a small crowd, was it? Because of one man's testimony. And put his fingers in his ears, and he spat, on his, he spat and touched his tongue. Then looking up to heaven, he sighed and said to him, Ephatha, that is, be opened. Immediately, his ears were opened, and the impediment of his tongue was loosed, and he spoke plainly. Then he commanded them that they should tell no one. But the more he commanded them, who's the them? The people of the city. The more widely they proclaimed it. Isn't it amazing? And they were astonished beyond measure, saying, he has done all things well. He makes both the deaf to hear and the mute to speak. Isn't that wonderful? That is great stuff. That is the power and the impact of one man. Not learned, not educated, but touched by God. He touched him, and he went, and he told. Simply what Jesus told him to do. I'm going to touch you, now you're going to go tell. But what happens to the crowd? It's interesting, because it's what we were talking about here tonight. The crowd comes out to see for themselves. We can't convict. We can't change anybody's mind, but Jesus can. Amen. Amen. And what does he do to the man? He heals another one. Isn't that awesome? And what does it do to the whole city? Instead of a whole city saying, get away from us, now a whole city is saying, he does all things well. Isn't that amazing? One person, one testimony, a whole region that was changed for the power of God, by the power of God. Well, let's look at another one. John chapter 4, verse 5 through 26. And this is another story that we know very well. We even prayed about it, using it, reference to it tonight. So he came to a city of Samaria, which is called Sychar, near the plot of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Now Jacob's well was there. Jesus, therefore, being wearied from his journey, sat thus by the well, and it was about the sixth hour. A woman of Samaria came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. When the woman of Samaria said to him, How is it that you, being a Jew, ask a drink from me, a Samaritan woman? For Jews have no dealing with the Samaritans. Everybody's familiar with this story, right? Okay, this is the Samaritan woman going out to the well at the weird hour, you know, the sixth hour of the day. She's going out there to draw her well, and there's all kinds of things about her. Jesus answered and said to her, If you knew the gift of God and who it was who says to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, Sir, you have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. Where, where then do you get that living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us this well and drank from it himself, as well as his sons and his livestock? Jesus answered and said to her, Whoever drinks of this water will thirst again. But whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will never thirst again. But the water that I shall give him will become in him a fountain of water springing up into everlasting life. Now, what's Jesus doing right now? He's revealing himself to this woman. He's trying to describe what I have for you, and it's something wonderful, right? I have something that will make you not have any more need in your spirit, not in your thirst, but in your spiritual thirst. Okay. The woman said to him, sir, give me this water. They may not thirst nor come here to draw. She doesn't want to go there again, right? So go ahead. Jesus said, go. Go. 
Call your husband and come here. The woman answered and said, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, you have said, well, I have no husband. For you have had five husbands, and the one whom you now have is not your husband. That you spoke truly. In that you spoke truly. So he is now even revealing his prophetic side to her. Correct? Let's go on. The woman said to him, sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Now, let's ask this question. This lady's been talked about, and I'm not here to talk about her life or her stuff too much. But obviously, somebody who's had five husbands has lived a somewhat um, storied past, let's just put it that way, and um, has got some problems in her life. But Jesus comes and talks to her and reveals that he's a prophet to her. Does this woman, even though she has sinned and has some problems, have a heart for God? Yes? Knows? Yes, of course she does, right? Because she's going to ask the one question that shows she wants to do it right, right? So let's see what the question is. Our fathers worshiped up in this mountain, and you Jews say that in Jerusalem is the place where one ought to worship. Now, so she asked the question. She's trying to be good, right? She's trying to follow the law. She's got a heart for God, and she said, I want to do things right. I keep falling, but... Should I worship on the mountain or should I worship in Jerusalem? That's the one question she asks Jesus. Is that the right question? Well, it's a good one. You know, there's no wrong question when you ask Jesus a question because he's going to give you the answer, which is exactly what he gives to her right now. Our fathers worshiped on this mountain. Should we worship in Jerusalem or wherever? He says, woman, believe me, the hour is coming when you will neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We know what we worship for salvation is of the Jews. But the hour is coming and now is when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth, for the Father is seeking such to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. He's educating this lady. He's telling her things to come. It's amazing, right? He's prophesying to probably the woman who the town would say is the least worthy to receive a prophecy. But who does Jesus seek out? The least worthy person in that place. It's amazing. Now, uh, 26, oh, 25, I'm sorry, yep. The woman said, I know the Messiah is coming. See, she's seeking God. She, is she not? She is a lady who's seeking God. When he comes, he will tell us all things. Amen. Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. Now, how many times in the Bible does Jesus out and out say, I'm the one? Now, not that many, to be honest with you. But he reveals it to this lady who the town would say is the most unworthy. And he said, I'm the one. And he's revealing himself to her in a beautiful way that's touching her soul and spirit. Right? We just uh, talked about the guy who was freed from demons. Now this lady is being touched in her soul. So much so that when she goes back to the town... She tells everybody, right? Let's go down to, I think it's uh, uh, 39, I do believe. Yeah, here we go. And many of the Samaritans of that city believed in him because of the word of the woman who testified, he told me all that I ever did. Now, how complicated is that testimony? Eight words, right? Eight words, he told me all that I ever did, and he went out, she went out and told the whole town. Everything that went out. As a matter of fact, it says, I think it might be the next verse, she told the men of the town, which is amazing when you look at that. So when the Samaritans had come to him, meaning Jesus, they urged him to stay with them, and he stayed, with there, stayed there two more days. And many more believed because of his own word. Again, do you see the pattern? God touches somebody. She tells they're drawn now he gets to reveal himself to them. Same pattern, same pattern with the, uh, with the demoniac guy. He touches somebody. They tell. Now they're going to come out and see what's going on, and God gets a chance to reveal himself to them. Again, just like we prayed, it's the Holy Spirit that's going to draw these people, but something has to get them to come. All right. 
They said to the woman, now we believe not because of what you said, for we ourselves have heard him. There's an example. There's the words right there. Is that, okay, you told us, you got our interest up, we came, but now we heard it. Now we've been touched, and we know that this is indeed the Christ. Now, who else said that? Peter. And what did Jesus say about that? Blessed are you, because flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but the Spirit. Right? Can you put that verse back up there again, the last one that we were on? Okay, the Savior of the world. So what happened? Here's our pattern. God touches. They tell. People come. Or there's an interest, okay, in the people. God's going to start bringing them there. So this is our example of this lady. What was the impact? What was the impact of Our Lady's testimony? Of our demoniac guy, he went out. One man told his testimony and a whole region was changed. Our lady comes out, tells her testimony, and a whole city was changed. Isn't that amazing? Now, one more. Let's go to John chapter 9. And we're going to kind of go through the whole chapter just about. Now, as Jesus passed by, he saw a man who was blind from birth. And his disciples asked him, saying, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? And Jesus answered, Neither this man or his parents sinned, but that the works of God should be revealed in him. And another version has that the glory of God should be revealed in him. Now, what's happening? There's a blind man. He's been blind since birth. Jesus is about to reveal himself to the blind man. For the glory of God, so that the glory of God can shine out of this. Okay, let's go on. I must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. The night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. When he had said these things, he spat on the ground and made clay with the saliva, and he anointed the eyes of the blind man with the clay. And he said to him, go wash in the pool of Siloam, which is translated sent. So he went and washed and came back seeing. Therefore, the neighbors, the neighbors, how about that one? Okay, so you kind of get a feel for where this guy's going. The people who had seen him, the people he's around. It's not, you know, a big missions project, but it's just the local people. The neighbors of those who previously had seen that he was blind said, is this not he who sat and begged? Some said, this is he. Others said, he looks like him. And he said, I am he. Therefore, they said to him, how were your eyes opened? Well, this is interesting. Are we seeing a pattern develop? How did this happen to you? What happened to you? Right? The people are now interested in this. And he answered and said, A man called Jesus made clay, anointed my eyes, and said to me, Go to the pool of Siloam and wash. So I went and washed, and I received sight. Now, what's he saying? The facts, ma'am. Right? Just the facts. It's like, this is what happened to me. Now, an uneducated beggar guy just telling the story. Just telling the story of what Jesus did for him, okay? Then they said to him, where is he? He said, I don't know. Now, this is a very important verse in this chapter because we see that Jesus had done this miracle and sent him to go to this pool and wash, but somehow they were separated. And just remember that. Put that in the back of your mind for two minutes from now, all right? They brought him who was formerly bl was blind to the Pharisees. Ooh, now it was a Sabbath when Jesus had made clay and opened his eyes. Then the Pharisees also asked him again how he had received his sight. And he said to them, he put clay on my eyes, and I washed, and I see. Wow. Three little phrases, right? Okay, let me just tell you the facts. He put clay on him. I washed, I see. His name is Jesus, right? Okay. Therefore, some of the Pharisees said, this man is not from God because he does not keep the Sabbath. Others said, how can a man who is a sinner do such a sign? And there was a division among them. Ooh, isn't that interesting? If there's division in a house, where does it come from? Satan, right? Okay. They said to the blind man again, what do you say about him because he has opened your eyes? He said he's a prophet. But the Jews did not believe concerning him that he had been blind and received his sight until they called the parents of him who had received his sight. 
And they asked him, saying, Is this your son who you say was born blind? How then does he now see? His parents answered them and said, We know this is our son, and that he was blind, born blind. But by what means he now sees, we do not know. Or who opened his eyes, we do not know. He is of age. Ask him. He will speak for himself. His parents said these things. Now listen to this one. Because they feared the Jews. All right? And this is a story that a lot of people know. For the Jews had agreed already that if anyone confessed he was the Christ, he would be put out of the synagogue. And that's a big deal. It would be like being kicked out of the only church in town. And uh, social stigma with that. Uh, certainly some isolation, loneliness, those kind of things that go along with that. So there was some punishment going to be involved if somebody declared he was the Christ, okay? Therefore, his parents said, he is of age, ask him. So they called again. Call, he, they again called the man who was blind and said to him, give God the glory. We know that this man is a sinner. Speaking of Jesus. He answered and said, whether he is a sinner or not, I do not know. One thing I know, that though I was blind, now I see. Then they said to him, what, what did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? And he said to them, I told you already, and you did not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Now, here's the closing of the deal, right? So he's down to, he's witness to these people, right? Do you want to become his disciples? Love it, right? The blind man is now preaching to the Pharisees and saying, do you guys want to convert too, right? It's an amazing statement. I, lo I love this section of scripture. I love that he said that to them. Go ahead. Then they reviled him and said, you are his disciple, but we are Moses' disciple. We know that God spoke to Moses. As for this fellow, we do not know where he is from. Now, this guy starts to preach even more to the Pharisees, right? He's going to tell them the character of God and what qualifies Jesus as the Christ, the man answered and said to them, Why, this is a marvelous thing that you do not know where he is from. Yet he has opened my eyes. Now we know that God does not hear sinners, but if anyone is a worshiper of God and does his will, he hears them. Since the world began, it has been unheard of that anyone opened the eyes of one who was born blind. Now this is the blind man still talking, and he's preaching to these guys. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. They answered and said to him, you were completely born in sin, and you are teaching us, and they cast him out, right? So this guy gets excommunicated from the synagogue because of his worship of Christ and claiming him, claiming that he's the Christ. So it cost him something. But something very interesting happens, and it's the only event of this I can see in the Bible, and I'm willing to be corrected if somebody knows. Next verse. Jesus heard that they had cast him out, and when he had found him, he said to him, do you believe in the Son of God? We're going to hold it right there for a minute. So, the only person in the Bible that Jesus healed that he deliberately sought out again. Why that guy? Because his testimony cost him something, and there was one person who intimately could share that feeling of rejection, and it was Jesus. And he sought him out. Okay, let's go on. And he answered and said, Who is he, Lord, that I may believe in him? Do you think this guy was searching for God too? He was searching for God. And Jesus said to him, You have both seen him, and it is he who is talking with you. Then he said, Lord, I believe, and he worshiped him. Isn't that beautiful? That's wonderful. What was the culmination of this guy's testimony? One great thing, Jesus sought him out, right? His testimony touched the heart of God himself to a point of I'm going to find you and I'm going to let you worship with me more intimately than you have ever done in your life, right? If your testimony costs you something, it's going to bring you to a place where you can worship God better. I guarantee you that, especially if you hold firm to the faith. So, but what happens? You know, is that it? We don't hear anything more of this guy. We don't hear of his preaching. We don't hear of a change in a community, a church, a, a city, anything like that. But could it be possible that our testimony may speak to people generations from now? Is it possible? 
right? It is possible. Because go back to verse 25, if we can. One thing I know, though I was blind, now I see. Does that sound familiar to anybody? Does that sound like a line of amazing grace? And this guy's testimony from 2,000 years earlier, we are still singing today. Isn't that awesome? Isn't that awesome? And it's, the, it's not like a little singing. It's the kind that makes you want to shoot your hand up because it's where the divine meets the physical, yeah. right? Yeah. And we can see that based on this one t- man's testimony to a bunch of people who kicked him out, now we get to taste of the divine better. Isn't that awesome? Amazing. That is awesome. That's three people, three people that show us the pattern. How are you going to keep the church? How are you going to grow the church? It's going to be kept by God touching you. And it's going to be grown by you going out and telling what God has done for you. It's that simple. Then the people will be drawn by the Holy Spirit to a place where God can touch them. Isn't that amazing? Just like we prayed tonight. That's what it is. Three people, three original missionaries in the time of Jesus Christ. But what's happening? What's happening now? We're seeing this decline in Protestantism. We're seeing, um, you know, just uh, what looks like the decline of the church. But Jesus said something great. He said, the gates of hell shall not prevail against my church. Isn't that wonderful? That's the Lord. He's promised that. That is a promise. So where are we at right now? Where are we at as far as, um, uh, you know, the stats go? Well, there's some that I didn't read, and I want to share, okay? Now, let's look at a few of the primary non-mainline denominations, almost every one of which has increased in membership since the mid-1960s. The Church of God in Christ, in 1965, had 425,000 members, now 5,499,000. The Presbyterian Church America, in 1973, had 41,000 followers, now 367,000 followers. The Evangelical Free Church had 43,851 members in 1965, now has 372,000. And the Assemblies of God had 572,000 members in 2013, now has 3,030,000 people. Why is that? Why is that? Because we do not deny the power thereof. We are a church that we, although we are not going to be a church, we are not going to be a church that has a form of godliness but denies the power. We are going to be having a church that has God's godliness exactly presented to us. And we will embrace the power, right? How would you like to go to a church that doesn't preach deliverance or doesn't teach healing or doesn't teach forgiveness or doesn't teach the word? And doesn't teach that the Holy Spirit can abide in you. The Spirit of God can literally teach you the things of God in your head and in your heart, even more importantly. You know, why would you go someplace else that doesn't proclaim that? Why are these denominations growing? Because they do not deny the power of God. Now, but what is it? What's making the difference? What's the recipe for growth? Now, I'm not against creativity at all. I'm not against luxury. I'm not against comfort. I'm not against good things in churches. I'm not against ministries that develop. Uh, You know, I'm not against light shows and music and all that stuff. But that doesn't grow your church if it doesn't have a testimony behind it, right? That God has to touch somebody's life, and they have to have the risk to stand up there and say, this is what he's done for me. Now, it takes one thing. No pride and the willingness to be humble and say, this is what he did for me. And it might be painful to say, but it might be what draws people to Jesus Christ. Is it worth it? That's my question. So there's a couple of things that I want to just close with. 
that are real enemies and things we have to watch out for. If I was going to try to equip the church, these are the two things I'd say, let's look out for this in our own life, okay? Number one, have we lost the impact of our testimony? Okay? Have you lost that? And it can be from a variety of things, okay? It can be from sin. I goofed up, right? My, my coworkers now saw me. You know, they, they know me, right? You know, I messed up. Or um, it can be from just problems, the next thing mounting up. Dare I say it could even be that we forgot the goodness of God. Could be. Could be that we forgot it. Could be just time going by and it's lost its impact of what God's done for you. Do you value it? That's the question. Well, if that's you tonight, I've got good news for you. And its name is the story of Peter. Isn't that awesome? Because even though he denied Christ, blew it with the other disciples, written, I saw him do it. It's in, you know, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, right? So they're all writing up about him. But he gets reinstated. Isn't it awesome that we have a God who can reinstate us? That's wonderful. That's worth going out and telling somebody about. That we have a God who can reinstate us, who can give us back a testimony. Right? So even if you've lost it, there's a God who can give it back. Isn't that wonderful? The other thing we have to watch out for, and I'm going to kind of close with this uh, um, group of people. Um, and this is really what the title of my message is. I waited till the end to give you the title of my message, okay? And the title of the message is, What About the Other Nine? And I want to go to Luke 17, 11 through 19. And it's Jesus talking. It's an experience of Jesus. It's not a story. This is a real happening, okay? Now, it happened as he went to Jerusalem that he passed through the midst of Samaria and Galilee. Why is all this stuff happening in Samaria? It's amazing, huh? So, okay. Then he entered a certain village there. Uh, there met him ten men who were lepers who stood afar off. And they lifted up their voices and said, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. So when he saw them, he said to them, go show yourself to the priest. So it was that as they went, they were cleansed. And one of them, when he saw that he was healed, returned with a loud voice glorifying God. One man glorifying God. One woman at a well, one blind man who gave us a line from Amazing Grace, and one demoniac who changed a whole area for Jesus. And this guy returns giving thanks to God. And he fell down on his face at his feet giving him thanks, and he was a Samaritan. So Jesus answered and said, where there are not ten cleansed, but where are the other nine? And the danger in our church, and the danger with Christianity, and the danger in the decrease in Protestantism and everything else is, a lot of Christians, or people who label themselves as Christians in the United States, are very happy being the other nine. They've been touched by Christ, they've been healed by Christ, but it was good enough for them to just go and be absorbed into society. You don't hear anything from those other nine. None of them. But one fell at his feet and worshipped, and it was a Samaritan. So this is what we have to watch out for. Keep, uh, I think we're two more verses. Were there not any found who returned to give glory to God except this foreigner? And he said to him, Arise, go your way. Your faith has made you well. See, we have a choice to say that, God, your forgiveness is good enough for me to be comfortable. Your deliverance is good enough for me to be comfortable. Your bringing my children to Christ is good enough to be comfortable. Your healing is good enough for me to be comfortable and just be absorbed into society. But we have a right to proclaim it with a loud voice what Jesus did for us. What has he done for you? Do you value it? Have we lost the value of what God done, has done for us? I'm going to end with one section of scripture, and it's Luke 7, 
and it's a story, verse 37 through 47. And we talked about this tonight, and I heard it prayed tonight. And behold, a woman in the city who was a sinner, when she knew that Jesus sat at the table in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster, alabaster flask of fragrant oil and stood at his feet and behind him weeping, and she began to wash his feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair of her head. And she kissed his feet and anointed them with the fragrant oil. Now when the Pharisees who invited him saw this, he spoke to himself, saying, This man, if he were a prophet, would know who and what manner of woman this is who is touching him, for she is a sinner. Now when Jesus answered and said to him, Interesting, Simon, I have something to say to you. So he said, Teacher, say it. There was a certain creditor who had two debtors. One owed him 500 denarii and the other 50. And when they had nothing with which to repay, he freely forgave them both. Tell me, therefore, which of them will love him more? Simon answered and said, I suppose the one who forgave more. And he said to him, you have rightly judged. Then he turned to the woman and said to, her, said to him, Simon, do you see this woman? I entered your house. You gave me no water for my feet, but she has washed my feet with her tears and wiped them with the hair of her head. You gave me no kiss, but this woman has not ceased to kiss my feet since the time I came in. You did not anoint my head with oil, but this woman has anointed my feet with fragrant oil. Therefore, I say to you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loved much. But to whom little is forgiven, the same loves little. What have we done with our testimony? Have we been forgiven a little bit? Or have we been forgiven a lot? What do you value? You know, have you, again, been healed a little bit or a lot? What's happened in your life? What's your testimony, right? Is it a little testimony or is it a big one? Amen. Amen. Because a big one can change an area with one person. A big one can change a city with one person. A big one can be written in the annals of time for people 2,000 years later to sing about. Isn't that amazing? So, I'm going to ask two questions tonight. Maybe three. If you're somebody who feels like you might have lost your testimony, tonight's a night God wants to give it back. He wants to restore you, right? Two, maybe you're somebody who's valued him little instead of a lot. I got good news. We can repent of that, and we can start valuing him more for what he's done. Maybe you're somebody who values him lots. Maybe you're somebody who is just happy with where you're at, and you're telling the world about what Jesus did for you. And you just want to rejoice, okay? So I'm going to make it simple. Not embarrassing anybody. So there's a good one, and there's a couple things we need to work on. If you are being honest with God, and that's all I'm asking you tonight. If you are being honest with God, if you want to thank him, come up. If you want to repent, come up. And if you need restored, come up. It's that simple. And that's as far as the questioning is going to go. If you just want to rejoice, it's fine. But I find it interesting that two times today, this congregation has been challenged with a where are you at and what have you done with your testimony kind of message. And I have to believe the Holy Spirit's still standing here and he's still waiting for you. And he's still waiting to touch you. I believe that. Don't harden your heart. If that's you, or somebody who just wants to rejoice, tonight the altars are open, and I'll be willing to pray for you. Circled by a heavy burden Neath a load of guilt and shame Then the hand of 
Since he touched me. 